Good afternoon. Story in New York. Today we have Harrison Scola. Harrison is a, a very proud Sicilian living in, uh, in New York. Harrison was uh, born and raised uh, in uh, Rhode Island and uh, had uh, uh, graduated from Rochester University, started a terrific career in academia, in, the, uh, in management, music. Then at a certain point decided that uh, uh, a call came which was basically to discover or rediscover her roots. And it happened during a tour of um, Europe where she ended up in Sicily. And as we say, the rest is history. Alison, what happened? You are, <laughs> tell us really how did you, from Columbia University, or then you decide to switch your career. Actually, you have a very successful career in this uh, cultural diplomatic endeavor to bring American, Americans in Sicily and to be the, the official uh, ambassador, cultural ambassador of Sicily, I would say, in the, in, the, in the Northeast. Please. Well, it's like you say, it was a calling for me to do that. Um, when I went to Sicily the first time at 23, I was backpacking through Sicily, through Europe, and I met my cousins there, and I saw Palermo, I saw Montreal Cathedral, I saw uh, San Giovanni dei Eremiti, this amazing church, the Arab Norman uh, Patrimony of Palermo. I went to Agrigento, uh, I saw the, the ruins in Siracusa, and I thought, why didn't I know anything about this growing up as a Sicilian American? And I thought, we need to share this with people, and, uh, and the cuisine as well, having eaten real true Sicilian cuisine for the first time while there. Um, and then meeting Sicilians. This changed my life. It changed my whole perspective on my own heritage and it changed my perspective as being a Sicilian American and wanting to share this cultural heritage with other Americans. So your perspective changed. Uh, how did you perceive Sicily and uh, Sicilian before that experience in Sicily? Which were your ideas? Well, correct, well even you know, most Americans, their, their knowledge of Sicilian culture really comes from movies. And of course, The Godfather being the most important of these movies and the series of Godfather movies. So they know the mafia, they know organized crime. That's what I knew as well. Although I did know my grandmother speaking Sicilian with my father and um, although she didn't speak English. So I, my knowledge of Sicilian culture was really limited to her kitchen <laughs> and, the, and being in Brooklyn, which is where she lived, I was far away being in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Um, so my knowledge was, was very home-based on one hand and then this mass media concept. So when I went to Sicily, and learned about this cultural heritage that existed and met Sicilians of today, it completely changed my perspective. So, so you tell your call, your passion in a very good business. How did you start and how do you recruit your, engage your clients? Um, right. Tell us, please. Well, having worked at Columbia University and before that Manus College of Music, I was um, in recruitment marketing and communications and public relations. So I understood how to sell uh, an idea, a feeling. When I was ready, I got to a point, because I was also a professional musician, but I got to a point where music wasn't in my heart as much as sharing Sicily became more important to me. And so I combined the skills that I was using at Columbia and my passion for sharing Sicily with people together. So um, it just made sense. So I'm fortunate that I, have, uh, a, I had a, a position at Columbia where I could present this idea to my, my supervisor and say, listen, I want to start a business and I also want to still work here. Can we do something where I min start minimizing my work here and then I increase my own entrepreneurial pursuit? And I'm fortunate that I was able to do that over the course of five, six years. So that's how I started the business. And, 
But at the same time, the first thing I started actually was my social media because it was at the, in the beginning of Instagram in 2013. And Facebook, of course, was already important. Um, and I was in that space already because of music and because of the university and the work promoting student activities and, and the alumni activities of the university. Um, so it just made sense for me to move into that space to start promoting my knowledge of Sicily and, and the incredible patrimony of Sicily. Wonderful. Tell us about your first trip. How did it go? Did you disappoint your clients? They, how, tell us about your really the first experience. Right. Well, in 2014, I did my first trip. I had three clients with me. So you have to start small. You have to start somewhere. Um, and you have to be willing to invest your own money and your own time without getting paid. <laughs> this is how it works when you start out. Luckily, I have family support as well. Um, and I, I met my, I have uh, my partner in Sicily, in Palermo, and was able to connect with very good people there. And immediately, my love of Sicily comes across to, to Sicilians, and so they want to help. And so having the help of local people is what makes the difference but there. An American client comes to you. He doesn't know anything about Sicily. What does he want to know? He will tell you, bring me there, show me that. Which is their curiosity? Where is geared towards which? Uh... Yes, right. So the first thing I do is I talk about UNESCO World Heritage Sites. This is always the entry point because Sicily has seven UNESCO World Heritage Sites more than any other region in Italy. Of 20 regions, Sicily has the most, right? So it's everything from Mount Etna to the Baroque, Sicilian late Baroque of Val di Notto, to the heritage of Palermo, the Arab Norman heritage of Palermo. So I start there. And once I tell them about, well, Agrigento has seven temple, ancient Greek temples that are in better condition than what you will find in Greece, then I pique people's curiosity. And then when I talk about the cuisine, and then I start talking about the people. So you start big. You start with the, the interest of these American travelers who are, who are, well, who are ready to go south. Yeah, tell us then, about... Then they want to see, then they pique their interest. The typology, who comes to you? Usually, you know, we know that the Americans, now they start to go south, but their main destination is the center Italy, northern Italy. What basic, which is your typical client or a person that comes to you and really wants to go to Sicily? Is it Italian American, Sicilian American or...? I get everything. Uh, now I'm starting to get more Italian Americans, say maybe 50% of my clientele are Italian Americans or Sicilian Americans, most of whom have been to Italy before. They've been to Northern Italy, to Rome, Venice, Florence, the typical itinerary. Um, and now they're curious about their heritage or they might be having a 70th birthday or a monumental you know, anniversary, something like this. But my, uh, my, my real heart and soul clients are professionals. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're college professors, and they've been to Italy before. They've been up north maybe once or twice before, and now they're ready to go deeper and they want to do something else. And once they start hearing about, like I said, that there's these incredible UNESCO sites, that's when they, they're, they say, okay, it's now time for Sicily. And which is their major surprise? that they, at the end they come to and say, you know what, I didn't know that, that, uh, that these things are uh, different. Which is their major surprise for uh, the, the one, well, in terms of sites, Piazza Armerina, the Roman villa of Casale, is what I call the dark horse, <laughs> because this is the surprise. People are amazed by this Roman villa that has, I think it's 63,000 square feet of mosaic tile floors, right? So this is something that people have not, never heard of. Maybe they've seen the, the bikini girls. This is the, the room of the 10 maidens who are athletes actually, but they're wearing bikinis from the third and fourth century uh, AD. Um, that's the one site that they often tell me how amazed they are with that. But then immediately they will talk about um, the warm people that they met 
and Maria in the bakery, and that they met Angelo at the fish market. And <laughs> Did you, you set up a little bit this scene with, uh, with Maria, with Angelo, to make a little bit, uh, let's say, choreographic, or is uh, you do? So tell us. Yes, <laughs> and this is, this is the part where mm -hmm. I, people don't realize that the common um, surprise occurrences are the ones that they remember the most, that they will talk about for years. So, um, and this week after COVID, many of my past clients, when they think about traveling again, Sicily is the first place that's coming to their mind. So, and immediately they say, Oh, and remember we did that cooking school in Trapani. We we made couscous from scratch, you know. And they say we we were, you know, it, that's what we. They remember these things when they have their hands in the dough when they're working with Maria to make the the pane kunzate, or they're making a, a foca a, what we call spincione, a type of focaccia. You know, this is what they recall. No, the Mi Ministero uh, degli Affari Esteri e Cooperazioni Internazionali is launching a great program on Turismo delle Radici. Yes. How many clients uh, do you have that they want to discover their grand grandparents they came from, go eventually in the archive and possibly find uh, the documents? Many. Many? Many. And how do you work with them, basically? Many. So I'm fortunate. Uh, my husband, actually, he is a computer scientist, but he is very good at uh, doing data analyst stuff. So together, I talk to the clients and I will gather family stories, what they do know. Sometimes they have a manifest from the Ellis Island records. They know mm. maybe the name of a town or they say Palermo or they say Messina, but you know this is a provincia. It's not necessarily the city of Palermo. So um, my husband got his Italian citizenship actually through um, his bloodline. And he, through that process, he learned about all the records in, in Italy and learned how to read uh, these ancient Italian handwriting, etc. So once we get the story from the client, we're able to then start unraveling the, the family tree. Uh, and so we are able to get a lot of documents online and we will print them out and we get them ready for the clients. And then I find a local insider in the towns that we, we have found that their, their family is from. So they might have said Palermo, but a lot of times it's Marineo, <laughs> which is a little, little town up in the, yeah. in the mountains, you know, from Palermo. Well, that's great. Um, let's talk about 2020. It was a mm. year very basically bad for every enterprise, for yours too. You basically you stopped your... Um, how did you spend that time here in the city, in New York, mm. organizing and planning for 2021 now? Yes, yeah, so I was at the New York Times Travel Show in January 2020. I met over a thousand people. It was uh, looking like my year was going to be the best year I was going to have for Experience Sicily. And at the same time, we heard what was going on in China, thinking, oh, this is in China. But I had on um, February 15th, I was at a party with, uh, with an artist, a contemporary artist in New York, and he was telling me about this town. He had friends in, in northern Italy, and the whole town had come down with this mysterious flu. And that was the 15th of February. And as things started to happen, uh, as the weeks went on, it was very clear that the year was not going to happen as I had hoped. <laughs> so, of course, I started immediately having to cancel trips that were, luckily I had clients in Sicily in February and they had a wonderful trip and got home, no problems. But my clients who were supposed to go in March and April and May, immediately June, started to having unravel these trips, trying to get vouchers, money back, plane tickets, all these things. So the first few months were spent returning money to people and, and, and hoping to keep them warm to return. And, and also spending time on social media to keep the positive outlook of Italy and keep the, or the positive attitude about it, Italians and Italy, which was not hard because what I found from Americans were, uh, the Americans were responding that they wanted to be Italian after seeing people on their balconies playing music and 
you know, making a brindisi across the, the across the vehicle. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what the Americans were watching this and watching these beautiful videos coming out of Italy that we could call propaganda, certainly, but were wonderful, emotional. Mm -hmm. cre they created this emotional sensation about Italy. And so I appreciate all of that because I knew that my job now today, as things are opening up, is much easier because of all of that. Um, so social media was a very big part of this for me in the beginning and then I started doing online programs. Everything from I'm going to be making fresh pasta yeah, tonight. How did you go? Because I, I checked you online. I saw you uh, promoting some specialties. Yes. How many followers do you have? How did you go? Did you, you did a pro bono for free? You made them uh, pay? But how was uh, uh, you you spread the message. How yes. did you go, basically? Yes. Well, I have a, a very big following. Um, having done the New York Times Travel Show and having done a lot of events in New York for years promoting Sicilian culture, I have a lot of people that I'm in touch with through email all the time and social media all the time. Now, once I got through mourning, because it was a, a very long period of grief <laughs> for me to lose all of this business and to lose the opportunity myself to go to Italy last year, um, I decided, okay, it's time, to, it's time to get people engaged. And yes, we start out doing up programming for free. And people appreciated that because they were home isolating and, and wanted entertainment. So I said, okay, we're, I'm going to make Cavatelli tonight online. And you're going to join me. I'm going to have a Zoom thing. You can log in and we can, you know. So they follow you? So they follow me and they came and I said, okay, everyone had bring your, one, your two cups of flour, your one cup of water, <laughs> a little bit of <laughs> olive oil, and let's make some Cavatelli. Wonderful. Well, let's mm. go local now because mm. you also you are very active locally in New York. Yes. You have this, uh, I will say, um, you call cannoli crowd, I call cannoli tour. Well, uh, how do you start and what do you do with these uh, people that they basically come to you for this cannoli crowd? Right, right. Well, it's huh? deceptive on one hand because the name, you think it's going to be all cannoli all the time, but it actually isn't. It's, it's, the tour itself is actually a, um, it, I, t I say it's a, my love letter to New York City that builds a bridge between New York City and Sicily but not really just Sicily, also all of Italy, um, in the sense that we meet people along the way who own businesses, so we meet Italians, and not, not Italian-Americans necessarily, but people who came from Italy in the last 20 years, or the last 10 years even, um, who have started businesses here in New York. And so part of the experience is meeting new Italians that are here establishing a life in New York, and then also I do a lot of New York City history that has to do with how Italians, generally 100 years ago or so, transformed American culture. In which sense? Can you elaborate yes, this is on very that? Important. So, so I hook you in because cannoli, everyone is like, cannoli, I'm going to come and learn about cannoli and eat cannoli with you. But once they are with me, then I tell them about the Italian uh, young women who died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire of 1911 and that of the 146 people, more than half of them were Italian immigrants and that this event was magnanimous in changing workplace safety, in changing the work week, in, in union, unionization of, of the uh, workforce, right? So this event was very important. I talk about what's the phenomena of the little slaves of the harp. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, but this is about the, the young children that were brought from all over Italy, Lauranzano and Padua, um, for example, southern Italy, um, who were brought by Padrone to be on the streets of London, Paris, and New York in the 1840s through the 1870s. They were children that were out playing music or had m dancing monkeys, dancing mice, etc. And, um, and, and this all changed when a New York Times reporter met Giuseppe in Central Park who was trying to escape his padrone. And the, what happened then was we got uh, Italians at the time who were scholars and artists that were in New York at the time, they got involved because they didn't want the new country of Italy to be portrayed by these young waifs, really. So what happened that grew out of that was um, schools for children, 
ch child labor laws changed because of that um, exposure of this system, and and also orphanages and. and so you feel basically a gap in uh, uh, that the institution don't provide enough Italian American uh, history, and you do through. Uh, that's something yes. very interesting. Yes. But Tell and the, so, the social justice that comes out of what Italians did in, in New York over 100 years ago and 100 years ago, how it changed America. These are really interesting stories and tell very us, important to tell. for example, what really is, according to you, the major accomplishment of the Italians in the city of New York in these uh, um, 130 years of uh, right. migration? So many accomplishments. Um, it's hard. It's really hard to say, and and I think again, it's been obscured by organized crime. You know, we know this that the, the organized crime and, and the, the gloriousness, quote unquote, of of or the gloriization, what do you call this, of uh, organized crime has has overshadowed the contributions that Italians have made across American culture, especially here in New York. So my father, for example, is a perfect example of this because he was one of the first. Sicilians, in fact, to work on Wall Street in the 19, in early 1970s. And there's a number of people that he knows who were also his age, who were trailblazers working on, Italians working on Wall Street in investment banking. But Giannini started the Bank of America, basically. Well, we know this, right? Yeah. But to, to be in an environment, my father talks about, you know, he went to City College, right? But he was with, in an office with people who went to Columbia and Harvard and Princeton. And so it's pushing through those barriers. It's, it's the normal people that presented themselves in a way to show that just because I'm Italian doesn't mean I'm a gangster. You know? <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's through all these things. And then we have uh, so, so many people that came through uh, politics, etc. You know, and then Mario Cuomo is one of my heroes. You know, here's a perfect example of somebody else. Cannoli are better in New York City or in Sicily? Which is the difference? <laughs> <laughs> They're very different, actually. Really? And that's one of the things that we talk about on the cannoli crawl. Listen, if you're in Sicily, you are going to have sheep's milk ricotta, or you'll have the ricotta made from the Modican cow, which is in South. Eastern Sicily and Ragusa, which is some of the most incredible ricotta you'll ever have in your life. <laughs> so this ricotta between the sheep's milk and the Modican cow ricotta is incomparable. You cannot compare it to what we get here in the United States. Um, so yes, and you're close to the sheep, so you're going to have incredibly fresh, wonderful ricotta in Sicily. And so it's hard to compare this cannoli to the New York style so cannoli. Great. Next tour, next tour, where you bring your clients? Which part of Sicily do you want to discover to present to your clients? Well, I'm going in October what? 2020. This is my first tour after COVID. Um, and we start in Taormina, which is, of course, the capital of, of uh, tourism in a way in, in Sicily. And we move through the island. We go, we have, it's two weeks, and we, we start in Taormina and sort of do a counterclockwise uh, trip. We spend time in Siracusa. We pass through Piazza Marina. Uh, I think on that trip we might stop in Ragusa on the way. Uh, and we are in, in Agrigento for two or three days, which is unusual because I like to go into the mountains of Agrigento province where it's really undiscovered. Um, but there's lots of incredible people and sheep and beautiful countryside. Uh, and then we head to Palermo and then we end in Castellamare del Golfo, in, which is Trapani province. So we have Erice and the windmills of Trapani. So there's a Wonderful. lot to... Somebody come to you and said, I don't know anything about Sicily. Please, educate me. It's like uh, me going to Madagascar. Right. So where do you bring this, uh, uh, your clients to really satisfy them and made them appreciate Sicily. Right, well often they don't know what's possible. So it's important for me to ask them a lot of questions and interview them. So I've had clients say, wow, you're asking me so many questions. No travel advisor, no travel designer has ever asked me this many questions. But I start with, where do you live now? And uh, what do you like to do? What do you do for a living, of course, is important. but. Uh, these are obvious things, but as I start getting into m more details about their passions, their interests, immediately I'm already 
attaching guides to them, I'm saying, okay, they, this is, they, had, they said they were interested in architecture or they're interested in food. Uh, so I immediately am starting to picture the person in Sicily that I know that I will connect them with. Because in the end, it's always the people that they remember. Yes, of course, the sites are incredible, but the people are what they bring home because the which feeling of that. Great, great. Well, which is your greatest achievement, according to you, in all these uh, years of your uh, um, experience? Something that you are very proud of. I really love connecting people to their heritage and to their ancestry especially people who didn't know anything about Sicily before they started on that, you know, they came to me and said, well, you know, we have some relatives there, we think, or we had, or my grandmother came, I don't even know what town. So once we start doing that research and we connect them with a local person in the town and they meet a living relative who then becomes family for life, and to be in presence of when that happens, which I've done many times where I've been with the client, we've gone to the, uh, the anagrafe, the Office of Vital Records, and we uh, find out who might be in the town, these villages, everyone knows each other. So these moments change people's lives because it gives them the roots that they never knew they had. As Americans, we feel a little lost until we find out why did our relatives come? Where did, from where did they come? Did you find an answer to that question, which is your... Oftentimes we do, and it's life-changing. It's life-changing for Americans, and this is something that Italians don't, know, don't always understand. But I see it in the eyes of my clients. They're crying when they meet someone. I mean, I get emotional thinking about it. It's, it's, it gives them a foundation to their own personal history that they didn't have before and they really understand where, why they're here in the United States, they might appreciate it even more, but then they also understand just who they are. And when they meet a relative or even someone from the village that they're from who has the same nose and the same forehead, it's incredible, it's an incredible <laughs> sensation. It feels like I belonged here, this is a place I belonged. And now I'm in the United States, but I have a place that I know I can This recall. is very interesting. How does evolve this uh, um, awareness that somebody says, well, I belong here? Which, wh wh which step do they take to really complete that journey? It's, it's really something you can't describe. It's, all, it's really like your DNA responds to the place. For me, the first time I stepped foot in Sicily, I felt like, even in Italy, when I was in Italy for the first time, and it was, I arrived in Bari on the, on the ferry from, <laughs> from Athens to Bari and then went to Rome, and as soon as I got there, I thought, there's something about this place that makes so much sense to me, even if I haven't been here before. And when I got to Sicily for the first time, it hit me like a wave, like there's something in my blood that makes me know that this is part of who I am. This land is part of who I am. And so it's, it doesn't, there's no words to describe the feeling that I think many people have when they, they discover this, this connection. It can just be as easy as putting your feet on the ground. Well, um, which is your dream to conclude this interview? What do you want to achieve with your, with your tour, with your promotion? For me, so much of my business is bringing attention to the, the cultural heritage and the beauty of Sicily and Sicilians. I want to see the economy there doing better. I want to see Sicilians being very proud of being Sicilian um, and their cultural heritage. And it's happening. It's happening and I've seen it since 2013 when I started my Instagram account when people at first were surprised by my posts. Like, I don't know if you know what stigiola is, right? This is a, a type of um, street food. It's, you know, an entrails that are wrapped around a green onion, okay? <laughs> or scallion of some sort. I posted a picture of, of a butcher in Bagheria making stigiola on the street. And this is back in 2013. And the response was, 
wow, why are you posting this? But wow, I love Stigiola. And <laughs> so the whole thing became people realizing that these oddities, what they seem is something normal and that they see every day is actually something really interesting to a lot of other people like me because I'm not, I'm, an, I'm American really. So when I see something like that and the butcher on the street making it, it's a fascination. And I have helped uh, over time. I think the social media has grown, and so many now Sicilians understand what they have and the beauty of their land and the culture of, that they have. They're proud of it, and to me, that is a great accomplishment. Great, thank you, Alison. That was a very good interview. Thank you.